thanks for joining us, um, whether or not you're here in person or you'll be um, watching this later on today or tomorrow. It's a Friday afternoon, so I appreciate your time. I am uh, the interim vice president for USF World, and we are the gateway for global engagement for the University of South Florida. And I encourage you to check out our website. It's just www.usf.edu slash world. We have a lot of services. So I think among us, there are some of you who are affiliated with USF and some of you who may be outside of USF, but our resources are there for your, um, to support you. And so I encourage you to check that out. And we're gonna look at some of those resources today. And Sandy has asked me to talk about global research. It's a passion of mine. I'm also a faculty member. And prior to this stint as, uh, as the leader of our global engagement unit, I worked in our central research office as a faculty fellow. So I have some experience on the research side and then merged that with my interest in global uh, working on global research in our in our international office. So I don't have all of the answers. I have some of them, and I'm going to share some information with you and hopefully get you thinking about um, how you might get globally engaged or become more globally engaged or a new opportunity that you may not have thought about. So I hope that um, that you find this useful and we'll we'll talk about some technicalities, but we'll also keep things sort of um, general. So, um, to start with, and I'm not, okay, I'm seeing this. Uh, this is just kind of an overview for you about the kinds of things that we're gonna talk about today. And um, we do have some case scenarios. We don't have to go through those, but we can if, if that's um, a fun activity, but otherwise um, we'll concentrate on pretty much, um, I'm gonna focus on the finding funding and the submission process, the post-award process is equally as important. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, but I will be honest with you, that's not um, where my skill set is. That's where people like Sandy Justice and her colleagues um, are of such great benefit to us who are researchers. So what are we all doing here? Well, we're all, wherever we are sitting in our, um, in our spot in the world, we all are facing very similar challenges. And these challenges unite us because we um, are all part of the solution. So you will be seeing more and more uh, grant announcements, RFPs, um, inquiries about uh, collaborating around these grand challenges, right? The United, Sustain United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And of course, there's something in there for everyone, right? There's not anything that any one of us is working on that can't be associated with uh, improving society or improving uh, the world around us. So from a from an administrator perspective and from a, um, a, a strategic perspective, there are um, universities are increasingly uh, focused on these SDGs or real world problems, these complicated intractable issues that are facing all of us um, and uh, reaching out to people from around the world who have different perspectives and different uh, um, expertise to put towards these uh, grand challenges and towards research, researcher mobility, whether that be physical mobility pre-COVID or during COVID, um, our researchers remained very globally active, but we were transitioning to that um, interaction in the virtual world. So I included this, it's from an article in uh, a recent um, issue of the Harvard Business Review. And it's, um, it's really not about research per se, it's about teamwork, but that's what most of us are engaged in. And it's about the importance of diversity on teams and what that does for innovation. And I have highlighted just one sentence here, contextual diversity appears to be particularly beneficial when teams work on challenging tasks that require creative, unconventional approaches. And I think we're all involved in that, right? We're all trying to find innovative solutions to um, whatever challenges are before us. And so there's a real benefit to being able to bring together a group, a team with diverse perspectives um, to work on 
a challenge, an issue, um, and it really can advance your research in ways that, um, that not doing so wouldn't. So a little bit of advice from uh, your international office, wherever you may be, we are very good at helping connect you with partners. Usually your international office will be the home of all your international partnerships. And those partnerships may be with institutions abroad, they may be with NGOs, they may be with industry, um, but we'll probably have a good sense of where to direct you um, if you're looking for a particular type of international partner or if you're looking for a partner locally because you could be engaged in community research in your local community or locally based or in Florida or in the United States, but it has a global focus. So we call that global. So how do you how do you go about this? Well, get in touch with your uh, international office because we do a lot of partner matching. Um, you may uh, you may go um, on a conference and meet someone, right? You may meet folks who are doing things that are really interesting to you in your field, right? There may be a issue that you're working on that attracts people from around the world because it's a really fundamental fundamentally important challenge, right? And then um, moving beyond this idea of researching on to researching with. Um, so, and knowing who your colleagues are who are globally active, right? So you have all have people that you are in your departments or your units or your centers who are globally active and they are great resources for you in terms of ideas and inspiration for how they got started, what went well, what, what went wrong. So again, reach out to your research administrators, but also include your international office because oftentimes there will be expertise in your international office that can help you identify a partner, a partner institution, a colleague, um, somebody who shares your passion for what you're working on. So this is just a highlight here of how globally engaged our faculty are at the University of South Florida. Um, we track this and we track where people are and what they're doing, not in a scary big brother way. We track it because we want to highlight our, our faculty's accomplishments, but we also want to have a sense of um, what faculty are doing and where so that we can better support them. We also look at publications that involve an international co-author. So if you've published with a co-author from another country in the past, you know that just by virtue of uh, spreading your wings a little bit and, um, and including someone outside the US, your uh, research has a better chance of being disseminated and cited. So we have some statistics at the top of this slide. Um, approximately one third of our publications at USF involve a international collaborator. So there's an international co-author, um, but they account for 62, two thirds of all our citations. And, the, um, and they generate three times the scholarly impact. So there's a really profound uh, impact or contribution that can be made from uh, working with folks from other parts of the world. And you'll see there on the slide where our most common uh, collaborators hail from. And you can look at all this data and I'm gonna tell you where in the USF Global Discovery Hub, and you can Google that and you'll be able to find it. It's a hub where you can look up USF's partnership agreements, our student mobility activities, and even more fun, our faculty and staff activities. So every single USF researcher, faculty, staff has a profile in the Global Discovery Hub and you control that. We try to pre-populate it with content, but we don't know everything that everyone's going, uh, do, going and doing. So you can always let us know and help us update this information. Um, so you can get a really good sense from the Global Discovery Hub of what USF's global footprint looks like. So right here you have a, um, a snapshot of the faculty and staff module within the hub. So you can do all kinds of uh, searching 
and narrow down um, if you're looking for somebody who does work in health disparities or um, you know all kinds of whatever you want. You can do a search and find out um, who your colleagues might be at USF. And um, you can separate it by research and, co and conference awards. There's lots of ways to slice and dice the data. You can download an Excel spreadsheet. So what I've found is a lot of times, those of us who are further along in our career, we have our colleagues from around the nation, around the world that we generally work with, but we may know less about the people who are right down the hall. So sometimes there are folks that you might be collaborating with on your own campus that you just don't know what they're up to because maybe we don't have enough opportunity to share that information. So there could be some real gems at your own institution or new faculty who've just joined uh, the institution that you might wanna work with or who might be good uh, sounding boards for ideas or good uh, folks to talk to about a particular type of global engagement. So. Um, sometimes we direct faculty or staff to the Global Discovery Hub because maybe it's their first time going to a conference in a particular location. This is all pre-COVID, um, but maybe they had never been to a conference in China, never been to a conference in Brazil, and we're looking for someone who had, who could give maybe give them some guidance or peer-to-peer um, -peer conversation about that. So it's a great resource beyond just the traditional kind of collaborating over research. All right, so um, Sandy is really well versed on this. We've done presentations together. This is kind of my sweet spot, thinking about how a university or, or a, you know, a research center supports the global efforts of their faculty, their researchers, their scientists. So there are so many offices, we call this the exploding chicken sometimes, there are so many offices that could potentially be supportive of your e efforts in your international research engagement. So we've just, there are probably some I don't have here, but depending on what you're doing, right, there are people throughout your organization who can have uh, could, can be helpful to you in figuring out how best to proceed, how to plan, and I'm going to talk a lot about planning. But again, this is just a visual for how um, networked we are in terms of our role that we play in supporting your uh, research engagement internationally. At USF, within the international office, USF World, we have a number of uh, support resources that we offer in particular. One is the Global, Hub, Global Discovery Hub, uh, tr International Travel Resources and Assistance. I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, we have a virtual global exchange program. We do um, Fulbright mentorship and talk about Fulbright as a way to um, find partners as well. Um, partnership guidance and proposal development support. So you will find uh, resources in lots of places at the university, and we try to complement what the research office does, not compete. Ah, my slide is stuck. Let me get my cursor back. Okay. All right, so this is a really, really text heavy slide and I'll move quickly through it, but these are kind of the fundamentals of thinking about um, planning a research project that is international and that will be successful. So there are compliance and legal considerations, human, resource, human resources considerations, purchasing and payments, travel and safety, but the most important, right, is you need your funding you may need your partner identified or your partner institution. You need to think very strategically about your budget. And what we're gonna spend most of our time today is talking about planning. So important to plan ahead and to anticipate um, opportunities and challenges to ensure that if you're working with a partner, you have mutually uh, you have a mutual set of expectations that those outcomes are mutually beneficial and that you are communicating that information and that everybody stays on the same page. We talk about communication a lot, but most of us could do a lot more of it. So in terms of identifying some funding sources, 
Um, we put together a resource list in our office that targets funding opportunities that might not be the typical NSF, NIH, federally funded programs. But I will say, because USF is always a top 10 producer of Fulbright scholars, the Fulbright program is a wonderful way to make connections with colleagues who are working on uh, research activities that are similar to your own, to connect with an institution abroad. They're very flexible. It's not the old sort of you're gone for a year, you can go and for a month or a couple of weeks and come back. It, there's a whole kind of spectrum of Fulbright opportunities. And it really is a wonderful way to solidify uh, partnerships because again, we want to work with people who we trust, who we know, who we understand. And so that is, um, is so facilitated through the Fulbright program. So we have a dedicated Fulbright advisor for those of you who are interested and uh, who are faculty and our Office of National Scholars works with uh, students on Fulbright funding. We've also had some success with the Marie Curie Awards. I think they're now called the Marie Sladowska Curie or Marie, yeah, Marie Curie Sladowska to acknowledge her Polish heritage, but they also allow for mobility. So through a Marie Curie Award, which is an EU award, you can either travel or bring a colleague to campus. That's true also with the Fulbright program. Uh, colleagues can apply to the Fulbright office in their home country and come to your institution or to USF as a Fulbright scholar. So when we think about research, it might not always be outbound mobility, it might be inbound mobility as well. There are also other funding op opportunities. USAID is a, is a fan favorite for capacity building projects. Um, if that's up your alley, Department of State. The NSF to some degree, um, Sandy and I were speaking briefly that um, the federal agencies are becoming uh, more diligent about international engagement and, and uh, lots of reporting, but there are programs with, uh, this one is the Japan uh, Science and Technology Agency. There are some options where there's joint funding on our side for American researchers, and then on another country's side, funding for the, the researcher in that country. Uh, and then the, the rest are here. So um, embassies and government, I will say the DAAD, which is the German equivalent of uh, German promoting intercultural and, and exchange, they have a lot of really uh, generous grant programs. So. Um, some countries sponsor these types of programs. Switzerland had a really great one. So, and then you may have international war, uh, internal awards and seed grants at your own institution. So there are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, so I would suggest, um, you know, again, connect with your research office, but also your international office may have some good insights as well. We usually uh, send out a message about twice a year to all the embassies foreign embassies that are located here in the US, just asking if they are running any or, or offering any special research incentives. Every embassy has a science and technology officer assigned to it. And so there are often uh, pots of funding that we may not know about um, unless we make these inquiries and then we share that information. There are also a number of programs that fund diaspora research. So if you are a member of a, of a diaspora community, um, there, there may be funding for you as well. We've had some luck there too. So I think I'll spend some time on um, the cultural piece, the cultural competency piece, since I'm representing the international office, uh, because that is something that um, your, your global office can really uh, help you with if you're, if you're looking for that kind of guidance. Um, so the importance of communication, I mentioned that before, that is um, so important to trust and, um, and a workable, sustainable relationship and understanding verbal and nonverbal communication can be, you know, those kinds of uh, nonverbal cues can be very different across cultures. Taking some time to understand the workplace environment or the expected behavior behaviors of a, um, a culture that you'll be working with or in. Um, how important is organizational hierarchy in that culture? 
I have this photo here of uh, folks gathered around a table, you know, where people are sitting and how people are interacting and who's even at the table has a lot to do with the cultural orientation of, um, of where, you, where you are. Um, even things like orient, orientation to time and punctuality can be different. So if you're thinking about, I have concrete deadlines and I need uh, receipts by this time and date, you know, you want to communicate those expectations because sometimes um, it can be it, it can be a lot harder to generate that information in some instances in some places than it can here where we just kind of push a button and and we have the information. I think we have a case scenario on that. Um, and then managing expectations, right? Cultivating trust and avoiding disappointment. And we I, we always counsel patients right, patience, because um, what seems to be a roadblock may simply be a, um, a miscommunication in terms of uh, a you and a, and a partner, especially if it's a new partnership, right? So, um, you know, sometimes if we're not listening, we, we miss out on these really amazing um, insights or opportunities because we are too busy. So again, um, it's a place where your international office can help, especially if you are engaging in research in a place that you're not familiar with. Building your cultural competency. I just have a couple of like funny, cute cartoons here. Again, it's something we could spend a whole workshop on, but taking the time to um, have knowledge, build your knowledge about what the expectations might be if you're working abroad or even hosting a scholar, um, that there may be um, differences about personal space. There may be differences about protocol in terms of interacting in a work environment. And then at the bottom of the slide, I have the, the context um, in terms of sort of communication, right? In the US, we're very direct. We say what we mean. Sometimes we come off as abrasive and abrupt and, you know, well, let's make some goals. Let's get this done and clock out by three o'clock where other cultures have a much more, um, a uh, different context to, to communication where it's not quite so straightforward and uh, US German like. Um, and so there's more preamble of talking and getting and, and having some discussion before you kind of get to this sort of, well, this is the task list and this is what we got to do and everybody go do their stuff. Very, very different um, kind of communication. Same outcomes are going to happen just different environment in terms of the discussion and the way that we approach the subject matter. I have a bunch of photos to share with you um, because photos are fun and eating is fun and eating foods that you've never eaten before is, is also super fun. So I'm just gonna share with you a couple of, some of my experiences um, on the road. So I was in India as part of a Fulbright experience for um, administrators. And uh, that's a picture of me with an incredible traditional lunch um, in front of me. And so there's nothing better than sharing a meal, I think, with, with your colleagues. It's a wonderful way to get to know people. There's something very personal and intimate about it. Um, again, COVID, we have to, I guess, eat together online, but um, sharing a meal and then being invited to a colleague's home is just the icing on the cake. It's just so amazing. And that's the, the picture in the center there where I was in Morocco and I was invited to my colleague's home and they put together a feast and it was absolutely incredible. And uh, we met families and we get to know each other beyond our research, which again is so important to that sort of friendship and trust um, between, uh, between folks who are working on a project. And then I have a picture of, I was also in Colombia and that's an arepa. Um, and it's incredible, like just a delicacy that was just amazing that we shared together. Um, so if you've had one of those, you know the splendor of the Colombian um, arepa with um, all the different toppings. On the far side is a, um, a J1 scholar who came to work with me from China. She's there with my dog and she actually lived with me 
um, which is not that uncommon, I think, for some of us who sponsor J1 scholars. And she was a delight and she taught me so much. Um, we did work together, but really what she taught me was cultural. And, um, and living with us and with my family was just such a blessing. So there was the research piece, but there was that whole other personal piece of learning a culture by having um, someone engaged in your life beyond just the lab or the field work or the, the data crunching. Um, so I, I can't tell you how much um, she taught us in terms of um, understanding the Chinese culture, but sharing the many wonderful things about it that we might not have experienced if we had just gone to China for a, a brief time. So it was just wonderful. So again, invite, invite your scholars, invite your colleagues, invite people to, um, to come to USF, to come work with you. In the bottom corner, I'm in Saudi Arabia. And um, again, this is an example of um, working within the context in which you find yourself. So I'm not a medical doctor, but it was customary for us to wear the white lab coat um, when we did presentations. So we did that. So that's me over in the corner. And then of course, when we were in public, there was an expectation there too. So you see me pretty covered up. I'm actually getting away with quite a bit there. Um, but again, it, it was a, um, you know, we're in a culture that's different from our own and we're going to respect that. And then I'm at the bottom corner with a group of faculty on a professional development trip to Colombia to our partner in Berenquilla, the University of uh, University del Norte. And we're there, we took 12 faculty on a professional development trip. So if you have a opportunity to, to do that, that's a wonderful way to get to know a partner institution and your peers, uh, because all these faculty were matched with uh, peers who are interested in their research area. And that was the purpose of the trip. And they also spent uh, the first half of the day in Spanish language, either in uh, beginner or advanced. And we all learned a very useful term, vaina, which uh, you can say in the coastal Caribbean, Colombia, basically in response to anything. It's like that word that just covers everything. So it was, a, we, we, were, we weren't supposed to use it all the time, but we did. So, um, so it was, again, we're learning the language, we're communicating in the language, um, but we're also um, finding our research partners and, and finding those little shortcuts like Vina, which is um, a wonderful, wonderful response to anything you get asked. All right, so compliance and, uh, and risk mitigation, right? So um, I've incorporated some silly memes in this presentation, um, but we do need to think about um, risk and security and risk mitigation differently in a global project. So again, we have some, I have highlighted some things here. There are many more, right? But the main message is be informed about the risks and challenges of your destination, right? And also the wonderful things about it. You wouldn't have chosen it if it wasn't a, a wonderful place, but also be aware. Do you need to be talking to your export control office? It never hurts, right? It's not gonna hurt you, it can only help you. Um, what do you need to do in terms of research integrity, right? What do you need to know about in terms of conducting your research in another country? Um, is there anything that you need to speak to your legal office about, right? Maybe there's a contract or language that um, is guiding your work. What do you need from the fiscal and business office, right? About purchasing or payments, we'll get into that. And what do you need from the travel, your travel office? We have a risk and security office that's embedded in our operation in USF world. Um, and they provide all these things below about uh, health and evacuation insurance assessments to help you navigate where you're going, 24-7 uh, emergency support. We also have a series of city and country guides that um, any student faculty or staff have access to that give you some um, knowledge about the destination if you're not, um, if you haven't been there before. Um, okay, so uh, itemizing travel costs, not just itemizing travel costs, itemizing, documenting, um, and, um, and making sure that you have information that could be requested is 
absolutely essential. And so in a global project, you're gonna be, wanna be very, very clear about who's responsible for documenting what, who has, who's keeping the records, who's maintaining the records, who's providing the information and making sure that the information that an agency or sponsor or government might ask for is going to be available should that happen. So the proposal development checklist, Sandy is fantastic with this kind of stuff, right? So if you have a, a research administrator who can help you through this, you are a lucky person um, because once you've decided on, you found a grant opportunity, right? You found a, a RFP or a solicitation, you've got a partner, you, you have a sense of what you're gonna do, um, now you need to go through that RFP with a fine tooth comb and make sure that you're going to be able to, um, to fulfill the requirements of the grant and that you, are, um, you have the support system and the, the infrastructure in place to do that successfully. So planning ahead. Right, so what we usually find, and I get the calls when the grant's gone sideways. So there's been a grant and it's international in nature and something's gone wrong. And so then I get the call and I, I love getting the calls about the successes, but I often get the calls about the sideways grants. So, and usually what has happened is something wasn't planned out uh, sufficiently ahead of time. And so we run up against uh, a challenge. So again, my advice is plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. Um, it never hurts to be super detailed. And all those things that you might think that you're going to work out later, we'll figure it out later, we'll build the airplane while we're in the air. Um, let's let's not do that. Let's work those things out. Even if they're difficult conversations, even if they're hard conversations to have, they're easier to have at the front end of a project than to try to solve once people have um, mixed expectations or I thought this was going to happen and now it's not. So we try to be as detailed as possible, even if we have to have some, sometimes it's hard to talk about salary. Um, I think I found in the US we're much more comfortable kind of talking about salaries. That can be a tough thing to talk about, but these kinds of things are, are places where you don't wanna have a misunderstanding. Business considerations. I don't need to read through this list, but these are all things that should be on your project um, proposal list, your, your, your checklist for before you, uh, you submit your proposal, right? So um, there are a lot of things to think about, but again, you have a lot of supports at your institution to help you navigate these things. So once you've checked the box, yes, box, yes, I need to pay foreign citizens, foreign nationals um, for this project, then um, your international office or your research office can help you know, okay, where's the next step, right? Is that purchasing? Is that payroll? Um, is that HR? What do I need to do to put that in place? And it's very, it's a good idea to have as much time as possible, right? Because um, if you need to create a subcontract or you need to hire people abroad and you need to establish a legal presence in that country or find a third party provider who can get those employees paid, that can take some time and your institution may have rules and regulations about the procurement process. So, um, and then comprehensively sanctioned countries or embargoed countries, again, sometimes that's where you've got to be. That's where you need to be for your research, but there's a whole nother set of regulations that you'll need to navigate, not insurmountable, but you'll need to, um, you'll need to have the time to be able to do what's necessary. Personnel, personnel considerations. So who's traveling, if anybody? Students, many of you will have additional requirements if students are involved. And then things like passports and visas. There are some many countries where you have to have at least six months left on your passport before it expires to enter. So if you are five months from getting a new passport, and you're only spending one month in country, you may not get entry. So, and a visa, 
right? Your international office can help with visas because visas can be tricky in some, some instances. And then making sure that you collect um, the, the Vita, the biographies, the, the appointments, the information that I've written here on foreign personnel, because it's very likely that your export control office or equivalent is going to run a, um, a security screen on, on folks. So, um, and then being aware of credentialing and licensing, there are, there are a lot of things that your export control or your compliance office can help you with in terms of navigating um, the world of uh, foreign credentialing. Compliance considerations, right? Are you doing human subjects research? Are you using animals? Is this a clinical trial? What are you doing with IP? Is that on the table? Who's gonna own it? Who's gonna control it? Is that well established? Um, you know, data sharing, data access, right? Data management. Um, and then is there language in the contracts that might need to be vetted? So, and what kind of equipment are you talking about? Are you talking about taking equipment? All of these things can be answered and navigated um, and are, should be um, well thought out before you, uh, equipment really can get tough, right? If you haven't thought it out ahead of time and specified what you're doing, who's responsible for what, because all of a sudden, you know, we'll have folks who say, well, I need to ship 10 computers and, you know, maybe that's not allowable in the grant. So thinking out equipment and is very, very important. And then post-award, again, um, I'm self-identifying as, as not, an, I've had to manage awards, but um, I definitely am not the research administer ex administrator expert on um, closing out awards and things like that. But again, there are things to think about. So once you've won your award and congratulations, right, the next step is managing it. But that process will be a lot easier the more planning you put into at the front end, right? So you shouldn't have a lot of surprises um, on the back end, even if you have bought equipment that you then have to dispose of or um, do something with at the end of your project, you will have thought about that in advance and you'll have a plan and you'll be able to execute. So Sandy, I'll stop here. Um, I have, you and I several years ago did some case scenarios, which I'm happy to talk about, but this is an opportunity for people who are on the call to talk too, right? To ask questions and talk and um, mix and mingle in this lovely virtual world. So um, we, can, we can talk about these or we can talk about something else or we can take questions. I'm, I'm at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kruson, Kiki. Um, you want me to stop sharing? You can if you'd like. Um, I'd like to invite anyone to um, share their screen or raise their hand, but I wanted to share with Dr. Kruson that many of the people participating today, most in fact, are not at USF. Oh, okay. So maybe you learned something about your own, your your institution, go find your international people and see what they can do for you. And, and if, if they're not good, you can come to USF. If they don't have an international office, you know, we do have a fabulous model. USF World is um, a sophisticated and um, well-staffed office of experts from lawyers and technology staff from and leaders in research. Um, Dr. No, do you have a question? Hi, Fawn. Hi, Kiki. Thank you so much for um, doing the presentation today. You I have could a... do this presentation. Oh, no, 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 Kiki. No, not at all. No, I don't have the kind of experience you think I do, but thank you. I have a quick question. So um, you, you may or may not know, but um, USF and my uh, colleague's institution in, in Spain, Barcelona, just uh, approved a, an MOU between the two institutions. So now we are um, getting together, discussing possible academic and research projects between the two institutions. And I wanted to know at what point should I start bringing um, administrators into the conversation 
Um, as you know, we currently do not have a director for um, the Sarasota Office of, of Global Engagement. I know that we are in the process of hiring one. If we don't have one in place by then, should I reach out to your office? If I feel like I, there should be uh, an administrator in this meeting with me and, and my colleague? Absolutely. So wherever you are, I'm going to I'm going to answer your question specific to USF, and then I'm also going to make it applicable to others. Wherever you are, there should be somebody managing international partnerships or partnerships. It could be industry partnerships, could be community partnerships. It could be somebody in the legal office. So at USF World, if it's an international partnership, like you're mentioning, that would be housed in USF World. But there are also some uh, partnerships that the MOUs that research manages because they're more like contracts. So it depends on what you're doing. So at most of the time, when you're working on a research collaboration with somebody abroad, you don't need any kind of agreement, right? The, the, your peers and the foreign institution may want one, right? Because they may like to see that, but there's no requirement that there be any kind of agreement in place for folks to collaborate around um, research. Now, um, but uh, oftentimes there is an a, a, you know, folks like to have something in place to say we have a formal agreement and, and this and that. If you start talking about academic articulation, which is, you know, we're going to have a dual degree, a two plus two, whatever it might be, you know, students are going to be earning credits, there's going to be an exchange program, that is a, a special MOU. And that may be what you signed, because whenever students are involved, that becomes an issue of tuition, credit, those kinds of things. So that um, we have a, a person in our office, Adriana Morales, and I can put this in the chat, who manages our international partnerships and she's happy to get on any, any calls with you. I am too. So I just was on one yesterday with one of our partners. Um, so it depends on um, you know what kind of support you need, but we are definitely here to do that. And I can tell you that Dr. Holbrook and I are interviewing the final three candidates for the position in Sarasota very soon. So we're really excited about bringing that person on board, but I'm always there to be with you and the partner or to talk about this separately. But again, um, when you start talking about deliverables or a contract, um, you know, that's, that's probably the research office if it's, you know, funded through a, a uh, you know, I don't know, the Swiss government has given you money and there's a deliverable. Um, but if there's anything involving students and student mobility, um, then then our office would would help with that. Um, again, faculty can travel back and forth without an agreement. Um, so there's, you know, most of our international research collaboration happens without an agreement. Um, but yes. Yeah, I probably will um, reach out to your office because reach one out of to me and yeah. I'll make sure we get you connected either to me or Adriana or whatever we can do to support. Okay, thank you, Kiki. Mm -hmm. Another great idea is to have if you have a lab, uh, if it's a bench lab or even if it's like a you know social science kind of field research lab, um, to exchange graduate students, right? Sometimes. Um, you know, once we're back to traveling, um, they, they can often travel more easily than maybe a faculty member who, who needs to be, or if you need to be in at your office. Increasingly, um, we see legal agreements or memorandums of understanding in place for awards. Are there templates? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my cursor back here. Are there temp? Yes. Yes, there are. So if you go to, um, I'll drop it in the chat. If you go to USF World, to our website, and there is a, I think that it says for faculty, and there's a section there that will direct you to partnerships, and it will show you everything you need to do. So there's a feasibility study. So what we ask first is because a lot of times folks come and say, I have this great colleague in Uganda, we're going to do research together. And we say, that's awesome. You do not need our, our agree, uh, an agreement. And we call it a general agreement. You don't even need an MOU. God bless, go do your stuff um, and, and find solutions to the grand challenges. 
But when students are involved and student mobility is involved or there's academic articulation so that, like I just said, we need to be involved because that involves money and it involves credits and it involves SACS accreditation and wherever you are, it's going to involve something. Um, but otherwise, um, we ask for a feasibility study. So we may come back and say, you don't really need to sign an official agreement. You know, you carry on. Or we will um, say, yeah, okay, we'll put that together. We do have a template. Um, it is required that the partner agree to our language. So, um, you know, we're, we don't usually, our legal office doesn't usually negotiate on that. Now that could be different for a contract, for a deliverable, but for a general agreement, um, it's pretty much standard. And then the MOU or the Memorandum of Understanding is where you get into the weeds and the details, right? That's where you say, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what you're doing. These are the expectations. Um, so that would come after a general agreement. And I, I will find that site, but we, we kind of lay out the steps on our website. Now, every institution or center may be different in the way they handle agreements. But generally, you know, your legal office is going to want to know there's going to be a template and they're going to want to have some control over what you're signing off on. And we so don't we don't accept agreements in other languages, right, because translation could be different. So. And some institutions will have um, different rules. If you don't have an international office at your institution, it may be that this goes through your sponsored research office. So you'll mm -hmm. definitely have to ask the research administrator or the associate dean for research in your area. Yeah, somebody will know where to send you. Um, David, do we have any more questions? Um, not in chat right now. We'll see if anyone raises their hand. Sometimes I like to think for a little bit after the presentation, let it percolate. Um, I'm putting our general email address in there, but um, you'll be able to navigate to that. So Dr. Krusen, when you talked about the newsletter that um, happens out of USF World, is that something that someone from maybe Boise State or Georgia State could sign up for so that they could get it too? Well, they can get it right now, right at this very moment, because it's on the website. <laughs> and so it's digital. So I don't know when it's last been updated. We have some staff changes, but um, going to our website and going to for faculty, there are all kinds of resources there. There's a list and they're, they're, it's all available to you. It's none of it's behind a, um, a firewall. That's so we- we try to put those together in enough time so that there's advance prep time. So it's not like here's an award, it's due in two weeks. It is tricky when you're writing for grants um, that have international project sites or an audience that is outside the US, especially finding those funding opportunities. What has been your experience? What, what are some tips or tricks that you would give to early career faculty? I would, well, I'm not, I can't stop uh, promoting Fulbright only because we've had such success with it at USF, but it's also just such a wonderful program. It's, it's truly unique. Uh, it's, it's a very different type of application. It's not your traditional grant application. So it's not about convincing uh, the Fulbright organization that you are the only one who has the knowledge to do what you're suggesting. It's really about talking about the partnership between you and the host institution, your partner institution or your peers and what you're going to put into it and what you expect to um, get out of it. So, um, so I think, and I would say, if you apply for a Fulbright and you don't get it, apply again, right? Be reflective on what, what you did, right? Don't just submit the same thing. And if you don't get it, apply again. I cannot tell you how many really spectacular faculty we've had where it's taken three tries to get it right. Um, and we have a dedicated advisor. So some of the awards are super competitive. There's one award from the whole entire United States to Australia. We've had a faculty who won that after three tries. 
So this is somebody who's competing against every other scholar in the nation. So, um, you know, that's a, and it, it, if you can, you know, talk to your chair, talk to your boss, talk to your supervisor, because you're going to need some time away, but there's so many benefits that can come from that inviting visiting researchers over, maybe meeting graduate students who might come over and contribute to your work. Um, so uh, so I, I would say that. I would say, um, you know, if you're, at an, if you're at an organization that rewards capacity building projects, um, and again, that, that's a cultural thing, right? Whether or not your, your organization is, um, you know, really behind that, then USAID, um, 10,000 strong for uh, uh, work in Latin America. Um, there are some, the State Department even, they're highly competitive, but um, like any other grant, right? Try, try, try again, uh, because eventually um, you will have success, right? As long as you kind of keep refining what you're doing. That's absolutely right. And um, as we've gone through the workshop series, we've talked about some of those best practices, such as getting a colleague or um, a collaborator to read and um, do that internal review so that you make sure that you don't have refrigerator blindness in the way that you've described your um, project. And it's clearly articulated and, and understandable how it's going to achieve those project aims. What I love especially about the Fulbright program is that it, it is so flexible. You know, you can mm -hmm. apply for a Fulbright and be a month in summer or um, two weeks in spring and then somewhere, some other time. It's, it's not just a uh, cookie cutter of this is the one thing that we offer. No, it isn't. And it's so many different countries as well. And there's a Fulbright out there for everyone. So you know, that, that's important too, to pay attention to what the particular country is looking for, because you may have in your heart that you want to go to France, but your particular interest may be better suited for Brazil. Um, and so just be open to that because you'll be more competitive if you are. Um, also too, once you have a partner overseas, that partner may have access to resources. So I had a partner in Ghana and for the life of me, we couldn't get any USAID funding, but he could because the missions all have funding that they have to spend. So he would basically secure the funding and then we just had to get there and then he would cover the cost of our research. Um, now I'm not operating a big expensive laboratory, but there are, are you know, your partners can, can help facilitate this as well because they may have unique sources of funding that aren't accessible to us and aren't necessarily paying our salary, but can facilitate maybe field research or some other kind of um, you know, creative way of getting your work done, so. That's terrific. Um, David, do we have any other questions? Um, we don't, I, I don't really see anyone with their hand up yet. Um, so Sandy, could, could I ask another quick question? Jump in. Okay, thank you, Sandy. So Kiki, for those of us with families, especially young children, um, what kind of advice do you have um, if, if we are interested in um, doing the Fulbright? Would you say wait until the children are a little older or no, you know, apply now because they are always for you to do the full Fulbright, even though you may have to bring your children with you on the trip. So I think that that is exactly from the, the realization that Fulbright had, because, you know, back in the day, it used to be you were a year gone, right? Mm -hmm. And that was your only option. But that just is not a reality for most people, right? At least, um, you know, the vast majority of people. So there are particular countries, and you should connect with Darlene DeMarie, who's our, our Fulbright advisor. There are particular countries who offer, so every Fulbright depends, the, the package depends on the agreement between the U.S. and the, the country um, that is a participant in the Fulbright program. So there are countries like India, where they're very generous with their benefits for children and families. And so there's even, I think, maybe a stipend for children's schooling and that kind of thing. Now you won't find that in every country, 
Um, the so it just really depends, and it depends on you know your willingness to expose your kids at whatever age they are to a different culture, which I think was fantastic. So, um, and in a lot of countries too, so um, in Colombia, we have a lot of really great partners. So when we have Fulbrights who go to Colombia, we have one now, um, we often connect them with our partners. So they may be not, they may be working with an institution that we, we are not necessarily have a very close relationship with, but that doesn't mean that they can't um, connect with them for advice and support. And it's really incredible how the Fulbright community and partners will come together to support you. So I think that's a really individual um, decision. I will tell you as the, the parent of teenagers, they become intractable, right? So the younger ones I think are a little bit more <laughs> they, you know, they don't know what they're getting into. Once they get to be teenagers, they, they put their foot down and say no. So, um, so I think that's just, a, um, or, you know, maybe you're in a situation where you can be gone for three weeks, right, and come home and then be gone for another three weeks and, you know, in, in two months or so. So we have had families who do it that way where, you know, either family or, or another parent is able to stay with their children when they travel. So that's, a, you know, that is a big question and that's a, probably a different topic. But, um, you know, even going to an international conference, right, if you have young children at home and you want to go to a conference, you know, when travel resumes and it's, you know, in Singapore and you're going to be gone for five days, who's watching the kids? Right. So, um, you know, that's that's it's ju not just like Fulbright things. It's it's kind of any kind of engagement like that. Right. Where um, you you have to think about what's going to happen with the family. But for myself, um, my goal has always been, even since my kids were little, to get my kids out on a year long Fulbright. <laughs> and I haven't succeeded at that, but I encourage you to do so. I will live vicariously through you. Thank you. And you can do a Fulbright as many times as you want. They used to cap it, but you can be a Fulbright five, Fulbrighter five times now. Darlene DeMarie, our advisor, is a three-time Fulbright. Mm. So, um, and you can, you know, there are different, different types of Fulbrights as well. So I also think, you know, Sandy, you said like, what tips do you have? And we're kind of at five o'clock on a Friday. So I realized that um, it's like, woo, woo. But, um, the, the EU Marie Curie Awards, they're technical and complicated, but we've had success with those in ways that I never ima imagined. And they've allowed not just outbound mobility, but inbound mo mobility, which can be great. So maybe in your case, you can't leave your kids right now, but maybe you have a partner who can come to USF and you can be productive that way. So um we have a lot of support for our visiting scholar program. So wherever you are, if you have um, an opportunity to host visiting scholars, find out the kinds of programming so and support that, that is available, um, if any, to for those folks. My J1, who you saw, um, ended up living with me, which was not the plan, not the plan at all. But so it was a little bit unexpected, but it was joyous. It was an unexpected, beautiful thing. So, um, you know, I think that, I think all of us who kind of have this global orientation may have a personality that has some flexibility to it because you just don't know, right? Um, what, what might unfold and you just have to be open to that, so. Thank you. I'm so glad that you brought up the idea of family when and when you're considering what to apply for and how that um, folds into your research strategy. Um, federal agencies increasingly are um, providing supplements and flexibility and awards because they recognize that people get sick, people get pregnant, people get married. Um, and being able to have that relationship with your sponsor, having that um, rapport with your program officer really just supports those conversations. And so when you have a life event, they can um, coach you through, well, we have this supplement so that you can take your child with you, mm -hmm. or you can um, have funds to, um, well, create the gap or 
to um, understand when you're trying to apply for an early career or something and you got pregnant and, and it kind of put your um, career on hold for nine months. So having those types of relationships and, and making sure that you recognize that your program officers, your sponsors, they're people, they're human, and they understand that we're all doing this to move the research forward and we're doing it together. Yeah, I will say that um, having those conversations is important and also seeking out people either in your institution or in your center or outside, right, where you find them, who are role models. I was told um, you may not have a baby before you get tenure. And I had two. And I got tenure um, because I'm old and I couldn't wait. So, uh, you know, I great advice, but not working for my age category. So, you know, I, I'm not, you, you, yeah, you have to do what's right for you. And, um, and you, you can still be successful and have a family and whatever that looks like. Well, I think that this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, thank you everyone for logging on. Thank you, Dr. Carusin, for sharing your presentation. Um, of course, this is recorded and will be placed in the Canvas shell and will be available to everyone through the end of July. So everyone will have an opportunity to see the material, watch the video, um, through go through the slide deck. I know there's some case studies in there. If there's a situation or a question relevant to this, uh, please know that you can email us at research at sar.usf.edu. And I put my uh, email in the chat and I'm happy to have anyone email me. I may not have the answer, but usually I'm pretty good at um, finding, sending you to somebody who, who can help, so. We're very fortunate. So thank you for having me. I'm sorry I couldn't make it during the hurricane. I got pulled in all kinds of directions, but I'm happy to be here on this Friday evening. We're very, very lucky to have a vice president of USF World come and speak to us. Thank you so much. I will do it anytime. We're lucky to have great researchers, great support systems. So excited to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much. And you guys have a wonderful weekend. Be safe and be happy and keep writing. <laughs>